Okay. Uh, we'll make a start here. Um, thank you all for joining us uh, here on a Friday afternoon, uh, or rather very early uh, in the morning for one of our presenters today. Um, welcome back uh, any of those that have joined us previously uh, for our run of webinars. Uh, for those uh, new to this, we've been running uh, fortnightly for almost two months now I believe and uh, these are all uh, recorded for use uh, later by any of you um, if you possibly had some colleagues uh, that couldn't attend today that may be interested in these uh, we'll be able to provide this uh, recording to uh, anyone who requests it uh, but also uh, will inform you on where uh, to be able to access uh, this at any time after as well Uh, so uh, for our, uh, we're lucky today to have another uh, international speaker join us uh, in order to provide some insight into the great uh, product ranges of Aquaread, Mr. Ryan Cox, um, Sales Director at Aquaread. Uh, my name is Kyle McLaren, I'm the Sales Manager here at Hydroterra and uh, we also have Michelle, our General Manager uh, here at Hydroterra overseeing uh, things and making sure everything's running smoothly. Uh, so just quickly, uh, a bit of a bit of housekeeping. At any time, please feel free to type any questions you may have in the Q and A box situated uh, in the taskbar there. Uh, what I'll do is at the end, once we're done uh, presenting the content, I'll read out as many of these questions uh, as a, as time will allow us, and and myself and Ryan will work through uh, answering as many live as we can. Uh, if we can't get through them all, of course, uh, I will endeavour to make sure that I get them answered personally. Um, so as always, we see uh, these webinars uh, as a really effective and efficient way uh, of generating awareness across Australia on um, the various technologies uh, that we've seen uh, and perhaps you guys may not be uh, aware of yet. Uh, we always want to uh, strive to build as much uh, training as we can into the work that we do um, as this is you know probably the most important thing we're looking to have uh, the ability to adopt uh, technologies in the future so and uh, you know we lastly we identify what is important uh, for you and your industry needs um, by having these discussions and generating awareness uh, we always look forward to seeing you know some of the weird and wonderful ways you guys need to monitor and I personally really enjoy that so um the program today, uh, as um, as we have, is that uh, the main uh, body of the webinar will be will be handed over to uh, Aquareed's uh, very own Ryan Cox, who will talk a bit about uh, the range of products as well as some examples of uh, applications which these uh, have been utilised in previously. Um, I'll then just uh, mention the units we also have available within our rental fleet as well as a couple of quick examples uh, a bit closer to home perhaps of um, some applications uh, from existing uh, clients of ours as well with the Aquarii range. Um, we'll then finish up as I said earlier uh, with a bit of a Q&A uh, with Ryan and myself. Um, so uh, I'll, again I'll let Probably let Ryan tell you a bit more in detail uh, who Acarid are, if you don't already know. But um, uh, the British design and manufactured uh, water quality instruments, uh, sort of very a vast global uh, presence in over in over fifty countries. Um, but uh, you know, we've now been established Hydroterra um, as an exclusive uh, distributor for uh, nearly a year now, um, and already. Uh, in that time, we've identified that uh, you know, Aquareed is a uh, is a great suite of products, and we're really excited to represent them. Uh, as we've seen, you know, huge number of interest here in Oz and as well as uh, NZ. So, I think that's enough uh, for me for the minute. So, I might um, take this time now to uh, hand over to Ryan, if I can, uh, please. Sure. Let me just uh, share my screen. Buddy, get started. Get 
Is everything okay there, Rob? Yeah, good. I'm just getting the... Uh, it's because I'm having to use two screens. Do you need me to stop sharing or? Uh, no, that should. You yeah, if you, can you, so you can see the presentation now? Yes. Check if it work. Good, okay. Sorry about that. It's probably because, um, yeah, I've, I've never done a, um, I've always sort of um, shared my screen. I've never had to sort of uh -huh. share, yeah, share right it over the top. everybody else. So sorry mm -hmm. about that. So anyway, so, yeah, thanks, Carl. So, um, what I'm going to talk about here is is um, one of our one of our most popular products, and then I'm going to show um, some data um, from telemetry, and then I'm going to touch on a a case study, um, which we we can send that round um, afterwards. So we we have a case study sort of prepared, um, if that's okay. So. And then obviously, as Carl said, I'll, we can take questions um, at the end. So the, the outcomes from this webinar or the outcomes from my section. So I'm going to um, talk to you about the, the AP 2000s um, and I'm going to give you um, just a brief overview. I'm not going to I'm going to do my best to try not to, you know, to sell it to you. Um, but this really is just giving you a, a technical, um, a technical overview, really, of, of what the um, of what the AP2000 does. And then I'm gonna show you some, some data um, that's coming back um, from one of these probes. And then I'll talk to you um, about a case study that, um, that we did. Um, the case study I'm gonna to, uh, talk to you about was from a while ago, um, but these probes are sold um, all over the world. And we, have, we do have newer ones, but the, the one I've got is, um, is quite good. So just a brief introduction to to Acroread. So Acroread have been been around for um, since two thousand and eight. Um, we've been around for you know eleven years now. Um, we've been in Australia actually since since not long after the company formed. Um, we were uh, represented by somebody else, um, and then recently we've we've moved to Hydroterra, who are an exclusive distributor um, in Australia and New Zealand. Which was a great move. So we fit well with with Hydroterra and their best place to, to support it um, as we continue to grow. So everything, all of our products are designed and manufactured um, in England. So and that includes all of the sensors. So it's quite a rarity, really, for for a company to to produce and to to design everything themselves. Normally, companies in our industry would. Um, you know, um, produce a probe, but then they would buy the sensors in from another company um, or, or use others' designs. We don't do that. So our designs are obviously industry standard. So the probes that you you get from us, you know, you, you would recognize, would recognize how the sensors work and so on, but it's, it's all of our own design. The benefit of that, obviously, I'll talk about um, in a few slides time. So all of our staff, so we have around 25 staff, um, something like that. Um, all of the original founding members of Acroid are still there. So we have scientists um, at the company, technical uh, team, product designers, 
all of that so that you know, the normal um, full set of capability is read. Ron, are you flicking through the uh, the presentation? No, I'm talking. Yeah, I'm talking about this this particular slide. So uh, you should be, you should be seeing the introduction to AquaRead slide at the moment. Uh, okay, we're not seeing. Uh, we're just seeing the uh, the front auditor webinar page. Sorry, number one. Okay. Can you stop sharing your screen, please? Uh, okay, that's better. You should see it now. You got it? Yes, all oh, good. Ryan, thank you. Okay, good. Sorry. Yeah, no worries. So, as I, as I was saying, um, so this is the slide I was talking about. So I wasn't talking like, you know, to, sorry about that. I wasn't intending on talking to a, uh, an open presentation, but uh, <laughs> this is the, this, these are the slides I wanted to talk at. So, um, so our products, so we offer a full range of, of products. So we have the, um, single parameter product right through to the multi-parameter product, six sensors, Viper. We do a sound um, or range of songs for permanent deployment, and then we produce a range of levels. And again, all of those are made in house. We have distributors in over 90 countries, and I should say 50 countries all over the world, and that number continues to grow. So, um, and then everything we do is produced to ISO um, standards. So this is the um, particular product I wanted to, to talk about today. So it's the AP2000. The relevance to this is it's the most popular product we do. Um, it's the best at groundwater uh, monitoring. Um, it's because it's so portable. So, and usually customers will do sort of uh, groundwater applications with this, with a flow cell. They'll do chemistry profiling, going down a, um, a borehole, um, do spot measurements, the surface water, depth profiling with the level sensor, and then they'll do a short, short to medium term deployment. So this probe really is designed to be um, carried around and taken from, from place to place, but it can be put on telemetry as well. And I'll show you some data um, from, from this probe, what it looks like um, in a few minutes. So the technical advantages um, of this probe is it's optical uh, it's dissolved oxygen sensor, which uses optical technology. So that's not new news. Um, you know, I'm not telling you that because I, you know, I want you to think, oh, great, yeah, we've we've designed you know optical dissolved oxygen sensors. They've been around for some time. The optical sensor is our own design um, for DO, and what we've done is we've combined um, dissolved oxygen and EC. The reason we've done that is it saves space in the instrument. The instrument is actually only 42 millimeters in diameter, very thin, so it will go down a 50 mil um, standpipe or, or borehole. So that's a real advantage. There aren't many um, probes, or there aren't any rather probes that measure 13 parameters um, in one probe that's a 42 mil body. Normally they're, they're four inches plus. Um, because of the sensor size. So we use, um, you know, because we're a relatively new company, the, the technology and the design is, you know, it's right up to date. So we're using sort of the latest um, design methods um, and, you know, electronics design so we can keep things um, to a smaller scale. So in addition, you can add in two additional sensors to the standard sensors that come with this probe. So this probe will measure um, pH, dissolved oxygen, temperature, and DC. And then you can add in um, an ion selector sensor, so you can have things like nitrate and ammonia. And then you can add an optical sensor, um, such as refined oil, brewery and so on. And all of those sensors, you know, we produce in-house. But when technical, um, concerns or questions come up 
not problems, but you know, technical concerns, or, you know, often come up with, with, with sensors. So when you're working on a specific project, for example, recently I had a customer where they were um, they were looking at um, refined oils, and they reported back to us that the um, that the sensor wasn't giving um, the expected results back. So we downloaded the data from their from their probe or they sent the data to us and the sensor was fitted to one of these probes and what the customer was doing is they were using the meter which you can see in the case um, here and they were just recording the data they were leaving the probe for about um, for about five days so and this was in like a um, like a more of a process application really um, but it's obviously still um, you know groundwater related and they're reporting that the the hydrocarbon sensor wasn't actually recording any hydrocarbon um so what we did is we we downloaded their data and with our sensor you can actually calibrate to your relevant chemistry so um rather than using like a um, uh, nephalanine salt which is what we use we invited the customer to actually calibrate the probe in their own chemistry so, and what that basically meant then is the, the probe was looking at looking for the right chemistry. So when it was um, um, fluorescing, it was then looking at the right chemistry and recording the right chemistry and then actually recording some data. So we, you know, in terms of our customer support, we were able to analyze that data and then work um, to a scientific level uh, with that customer and their team. So that goes back to the, the previous slide, which talks about, you know, capability. So we don't necessarily just, you know, produce the product and then leave customers to it. We have the backup as well. And there are other examples as well. You know, refined oil um, is one example. Of course, you know, with all, all sensors, all additional sensors that you can add in, there are always questions. You know, there are always um, things that you guys want to know um, in terms of, you know, well, I think I should be seeing this, I'm seeing this, you know, what's the reason for that, you know, so we, we can go through all of that and you know, Hydroterra can, can, can support well. So we use uh, marine grade aluminium um, construction for the probes. The, all of the probes are anodized, so they are um, well protected from, from corrosion. And then the probes are versatile. So they can be used with the handheld meter, um, which is in the case here. They can use, be used on telemetry, um, or they can be used with a logger that we produce, the, uh, called the Aqualogger. And then they can be um, used in form of a, a sound. You can actually uh, have batteries inside the probe, and you can have memory inside the probe, and you can deploy the whole thing um, into the water, and that gives you up to a nine month um, battery life. Okay. So that's the AP uh, as an overview. That's the AP two thousand. So these are some of the key things that it, that it can do. Um, groundwater is is its main um, success. That's where customers enjoy using it the most. So they enjoy using it just to wrap up for the for the amount of parameters that it can measure. The fact that they can um, exchange um the sensors so you can change the sensors yourself so you can add in additional sensors you don't need to send it back to, to the factory um, for that exchange the cables it's a very versatile unit one of the other um, things that the the ap2000 has is um the optical dissolved oxygen sensor which is what i've talked about we actually did a presentation on this and hydro terror have already sh um, shared that i think haven't you kyle the did you share that, Carl? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. So I won't go into too much detail about the, the DO sensor today. And here everyone can see it because they've already already seen it. Um, considering it was my voice as well, which yeah, probably yeah. painful at times. Yeah. Well it wasn't too bad actually. It was slightly yeah. early, it was slightly yeah, slightly later in the day that uh, so I was a bit more awake. But uh, so the so the AP two thousand uses the uh, the optical uh, DO sensor. So with, with these sensors, there's no flow of water required. Our sensor holds its calibration for up to six months. So that's the the zero point um, calibration. Um, and then 
you don't need to change the the end cap as often so in in previous presentation i talked about that in detail but basically here this is the um, on the bottom left you can see the do sensor and you can see the blue leds and the red led and then in the center there's a photo detector so that's um just light based in the most um, basic form it's it's um dynamic luminescence quenching technology so in in basic terms we vary the brightness of these leds over the life cycle of the probe with the, with the same end cap fitted to the, to the dissolved oxygen sensor so when the probe is brand new these leds are actually um very dim because the cap the end cap um is um is completely black basically so no light um can get to it and over time that the the end of the end cap which i'll show you in a second um basically becomes more more opaque and allows the um, light interference so what we do here is raise the brightness of those leds through calibration so each time you calibrate the probe um be it, be it either a zero point for dissolved oxygen or the 100 percent saturation point the meter will check um, the cap and then it will increase the brightness of those leds so in doing that um the dissolved or the membrane cap can last for up to 10 years so whereas with other companies you'd be changing the cap every year um, so that's uh, that's a key feature it's also very fast so it takes milliseconds um, to take a stable reading um, it re reaches T T90, which is the um, maximum um, reading it will give, or maximum permissive reading it will give, um, in about 20 seconds. So it's a very quick, very stable sensor. So as opposed to um, a galvanic sensor, which we, we do make, or we do have on, on the AP700 and 800, so those are products that are um, at the beginning of the range, more cost-effective options. Um, but the galvanic sensor is a little bit slower, um, requires a lot more maintenance, and um, it is a stable, uh, it, it's nearly as fast, but it does require monthly cap changes and monthly maintenance. So really the AP2000, um, provided there's some basic points, um, points met each time you use it, requires very little maintenance really. The DO sensor doesn't need any special storage, so it can just be left dry. And each time you sort of take it out of the box, um, it's going to be um, going to be good to go. And then on the bottom right, you've just got the the, the various um, specs really. Um, obviously, things you'd expect IP68. Well, yes, you would expect a water quality probe to be to be waterproof. Um, and then we have a maximum um, deployment depth of 100 meters. So because this probe is just designed for you know spot checks and profile. Okay. So these are these uh, the sensors that we produce. Um, we produce these for all of our probes. So, and as I said on the uh, on the first slide, these are our own design. We include um, the standard parameters as standard, i.e., at no extra cost or or, or no sort of user configuration. Um, these just come with the probes. Um, the AP2000 is no exception. So you get the optical DO sensor, PHR, PEC, and so on. Um, and then you have the option of taking depth. The additional sensors which I mentioned, well, here's the list hit, um, on the screen now. So you can choose any of our IIC, IIC sensors and any of our optical sensors, and you can fit um, any one of those to the AP2000. Um, the specs are available um, in the literature which Hydroterra provides. So we generally have quite a wide range of detection with our sensors versus. Um, our competitors. So our ISE sensors, um, for example, have a very wide range. Basically, that means that the sensor is more versatile in the field. Um, if it's calibrated correctly, um, you know, they're very accurate. Um, we did uh, a lab analysis, for example, with, with ammonium or ammonia, rather. Um, and we basically did, um, we had a um, known sample, so we knew exactly what the, what the levels were. It had been tested by a, a piece of equipment in our laboratory, and then we used a, an AP2000 
which I calibrated. Um, and then our, our scientific director had the known sample. And we were actually in, within 1% um, of the reading that had been verified by a, you know, um, piece of scientific equipment that, you know, has potentially far greater accuracy than, you know, than a ruggedized um, field probe. And it was an AP2000. So you can get great accuracy with ion selective sensors. Um, it all really just comes down to the calibration. Um, making the calibration of solutions can be tricky. Um, but, you know, if I can do it, um, you know, generally anybody can do it. So it's not a particularly um, difficult process. Uh, in calibrating these sensors. I think it's just the um, making up of the solutions is the most important thing. So, yeah, so the best, you know, the, if you make the solutions up using sort of plasticware, that's generally um, the best method. So if they're made up correctly um, and at the exact correct level, you know, give or take a little bit, then the IOC sensors will be most accurate. So and I'm mentioning this at this point because these are just sort of relevant bits in case any any of any of you have already had an ISC sensor from us or, or are thinking of using it. So they're not um you know they're not problematic. You know they work very well. Um they last um six months and they need to be replaced. Um the same as um any other ISC sensor. It's just down to the calibration but we have a quite a good guide in our in our in our manuals, which um, just talked about the process. But the takeaway points from what I was just saying is if anyone has or will have an ISC sensor, make sure you have plastic um, uh, serological pets or, or plastic measuring layer as opposed to glass. Because um, uh, glass, you get basically meniscus and it, and it sort of adds in um, more calibration solution than you would have measured out. So but just you know follow that process and use plastic wear. that's the that's the most simple advice for those so the optical sensors so we have a um, turbidity sensor chlorophyll blue green algae sensors rhodamine fluorescein refined oil and seed on so the usual suspects really for optical sensors and they just use um either light based um turbidity or they'll use um, fluorescence um, for the other parameters. And basically, they're just LEDs that fluoresce at a certain wavelength, which happens to excite those listed chemistries. So very, you know, very simple sensor, um, very powerful sensor. Um, and they're calibrated quite e uh, much more easily than, than, you know, sort of any sort of wet chemistry probe. You just put, you just, you just put them in a, um, a simple reagent and you do a, a zero point and a higher point, for example. So for turbidity, you would do zero NTU, which is demineralized water. Um, you know, so you can go and buy that from the local store, um, just a bottle of, you know, Buxton water. And then you do a thousand NTU point and that process takes about, you know, less than a minute. So it's very, very simple. Um, and then the other sensors, you know, we do provide the uh, the reagents for those. So, and these specs again, you know, we have a wider range. Um, you know, we have quite a, um, we have more optical sensors as well than some of our competitors. So, have a look through the literature after uh, afterwards, and you know, look at the specs and so on. And as I said before, you can add um, one of each of these sensors to the AP2000 um, in addition to the standard parameters which it comes with a standard, so, okay. This is what the AP2000 looked like. Um, it's 42 mil in diameter, as I said. So this is a fully loaded AP2000. So this is what it would look like um, populated with um, loads of sensors. So you've got the DOEC and temperature sensor here. So that's the optical DO sensor cap I was talking about earlier. So you can see there when it's brand new, it's nice and fresh. And then we've got the, the pH sensor here. Our pH sensor, we actually use a combi electrode. So it comes with ORP, which you can see on, on the pin here. Um, and it's a um, ceramic uh, junction um, gel filled electrode. It's not refillable. We don't do a refillable um, pH sensor. The main idea of this 
is it's very stable and you replace them every uh, 12 months and this is something you can do because you can see the threads here so you can that sense so the idea um, with a replaceable pH sensor is you know some customers say well why can't you just make it refillable sure you know we absolutely we could make a refillable sensor and fit them to our probes problems with refillable sensors is generally unless you take them into a lab um, and make sure they are absolutely clean and refilled correctly you know with fresh clean solution and then calibrate it fully you know there's a lot of margin for error um, you know that, that can can happen there you know most customers yeah will will do it will do it properly most of our customers want something that they can use and just take into the field and just and just use it and you know it's field ready um you know, but with Without having to sort of mess around with you know refilling pH sensors. Some competitors, for for example, in situ, um, they have a you know a very nice um, refillable um, pH um, reference. So you know they don't use a gel filled sensor like ours. You can keep refilling it. One of the advantages of that is you don't have to keep exchanging the pH sensor. So, but. You know, in response to that, our pH sensor is actually generally low cost, so it's not an expensive um, thing to replace on a yearly basis, and it's very accurate as well. You know, but the added the added advantage of that is, you can just buy the pH sensor from Hydrotera, screw it into the probe, do a calibration, and the whole thing takes you about five minutes. So you know, there are advantages for pH sensors. You know, all, all sorts of different pH sensors. Um, usually with these probes, you have one pH sensor design and it's sort of it's designed to fit all applications. Obviously, pH is a massive thing and there are loads of different types of pH sensor you can buy. Um, we do do a couple of different options. So this, this sensor, pH sensor you see here is standard. That's our standard offering. We do one for um, low EC environments. So anything below sort of 100 or below 150 microsiemens, and this sensor will start to struggle. It's rare that you would, you know, be measuring in, you know, that sort of um, that sort of water generally. Um, so we do a low EC version, and then we do a double junction Teflon um, junction version, and that is actually better for harsher chemistry. So if you're looking at sort of leachates, you're looking at anything like that we have a double junction sensor. So we do have some options. So the idea with a double junction sensor is it is less prone um, to saturation um, um, than a single junction sensor. And the Teflon um, junction, yeah, is just more hardy, basically, um, for, the, uh, for the chemistry. So we have a couple of options. Um, it, it's rare that people take those, but in Singapore, for example, um, they do take the double junction sensor as standard um, just by virtue of the fact of, of, of what they're doing. So they're actually in a, in a saltier environment um, there. So higher EC. And they're actually using this, this, partic this particular model in fish farms, so, um, which obviously presents its own challenges. So they don't use any iron selective sensors um, because of the, you know, the high salt content. But we do have sort of you know, different configurations for those particular types of applications. So just to wrap this slide up, um, so you have the um, DOEC sensor here on the right hand side. That's where the pH sensor goes. And then you have a depth sensor in the middle, um, temperatures on the DO sensor. And then you have um, a port for the optical sensor, which is the larger port. And then you have a port for the ISC sensor. These are sensors you can replace. Okay, you can add those in. So you don't need to buy all of your sensors all at once. It comes with the standard parameters, which are on the left here. And then you can add any one of these in at a later stage. So it's configurable at any time. Okay. So I haven't got too much left now, and then I can uh, I'll stop talking. I promise. So. Ways of communicating with the probe, just quickly. So we have a GPS aquameter. I'll go into a bit more detail on that on the next slide. That's our standard way of communicating with our probes. 
So every package comes with one of those meters and it, the meter does everything. So it allows you to calibrate the probe, which is a simple push button process. So you don't have to input things like on other probes, things like atmospheric pressure. You don't have to adjust the pH scale, anything like that. You get the reagents, you make the reagents up, you open the reagents, you clean the probe, you put the probe into the reagent, and then you press the button. The meter then does it um, automatically for you. So the, me the meter knows what the solution should read, the meter knows what the probe should read, and then it will calibrate. And calibrations are stored in the probe, not the meter. So you can use any meters, any Aperib meter on our probe. So you don't have to use the same meter. All the information is stored inside the probe body. So we do a logger, um, which is called the, the aqua logger. So if you want to leave um, the probes out in the field for a prolonged period of time, um, generally anything over sort of, you know, a week or if it's going to rain or such like, use the aqua logger because it's um, waterproof. And the aqua logger will sit on the surface and um, record um, up to 32,000 sets of data and give you six months of battery life. If you want to put the probes onto telemetry, um, you use the black box, which is this um, device here. It is actually very small. It looks massive on the picture, um, but it, it is very small. It's just a little bit bigger than a credit card. Um, and that basically converts our probes language into SDI 12 or Modbus. So our probes don't output SDI 12 or Modbus standard. You do have to use a converter. Some people don't like that. Um, but the thing I would say to that is the black box ensures that the data you receive to your telemetry, I'm going to use telemetry in a minute, data is the same as if it was you were using the meter up here. There are no differences. So this black box will do all of the temperature corrections for your pH, ISC, all of the sensors. Um, it will do the atmospheric pressure compensation. Um, for the required sensors, including depth, because we don't use vented cable um, for our sensors. We have a, a pressure sensor in the meter, in the aqua logger, or in the black box. And then it will cancel out any noise as well. So telemetry devices, uh, devices can be noisy, you know, when you're on site, unless you have nicely, perfectly terminated connections. Um, there can be noise, noise interference, and such like. This device will cancel out all of that. So pH sensors, for example, are, are prone to um, noise and interference um, from obviously maybe electrical current connections and so on. The black box will cancel that out. It will also protect the probe. So if anything happens to the logger um, or the telemetry device, which is rare, um, but you know if it sends too much power down the line you know you try and send too much power it's going to blow the fuse in the black box which you can replace obviously if you have it connected to the probe directly it will blow the probe up you know and it's a case of you know, five thousand dollars for the probe where you spend you know a couple of hundred dollars placing a black box so and full information on that is, is available um but i'm going to show you some data um in a few seconds uh, on that so just wrapping up now, um, only a few left. So this is the aquameter. So this is our, our sort of main communication offering with all of our probes. So those are some of the points there, um, some of the things that it comes with. So you basically use this, so you can scroll through the screens, but you use it to view the data. You can record the data into the probes um, memory using these keys here pretty much like a calculator um, it has the atmospheric pressure um, barrow sensor built in so it'll do the same compensations and so on so the, the, the data you see, see here is ready to use um, there's no external um, you know offsets corrections needed this is the correct data it's ip67 so you can submerge it down to a meter um, but generally it's, it's best to you know, it can, it's happy to be rained on and so on. So that's the, that's the aquameter. Um, you can um, plot the data onto Google um, Earth or Maps. 
so it has GPS built in. So for example here, this is a river um, in the UK um, from memory. Yeah, sandwich, yeah. That would have been embarrassing if I was talking about a river like in America or something. <laughs> I was thinking, I'm sure I recognise this picture from somewhere. But this is near to our office. So what happened here is, is a, a customer or a yeah customer, so from a environmental consultancy. And they basically just did chemistry profiling. Um, went up and down the um, the river, um, and then they recorded at different points. So what the meter the, the meter has a very good um, GPS chip on it, so it's very accurate. Um, the full spec is in, in the manual. Um, hopefully no one asks me exactly what, what GPS spec it is because I can't remember, but I can figure out the manual for you if you, if you do ask. So what it's done here is it's plotted different readings as they've walked down the riverbank. And it's recorded the chemistry naturally at each point. And then they've plotted it to this to this map. Well, OK, so the advantage of this is you can plot chemistry. So and you can see the change um, as you go along. So it gives, you know, one more string to the bow in terms of the date. Lots of customers do this. So you don't have the ability on the meter to add in a text based um, you know, site ID or whole ID. So that the, there isn't actually the option to enter text on the meter. But the GPS is good enough um, that you can actually discern between different boreholes or different locations um, in a river. So this is like a, you know, sort of a, a good feature um customers use it a lot there's one particular customer that uses it a lot a lot in the uk so they switched over from a, a ysi handheld which allowed you to enter text points so that was like they were kind of like well you know we want to enter a text point you can in the software which i'll show you in a second after um but you know they've just been using the gps and it's good enough so just two seconds. Okay. Okay. And then finally, this is the uh, the software. So you can uh, download this software for free. This allows you to um, download the data from our aquameter, which I've shown you, and then you can enter site IDs um, and so on. And this is where you export the the Google file as well. This software is free to download. It's in a number of different languages, um, but you can export the Google file here, and then you can upload that to Google Earth or Maps. So I'm going to uh, stop talking now. I think I've gone on um, a fair amount. Hopefully that you know that was a bit more technical overview of what our probes can do. Um, we do have other webinars, which I'm hopefully we will do again with with HydroTerra, which are much more technical. Um, and discussing, you know, a sensor in detail. Um, this really, this webinar is just an introduction to the AP2000, but it's designed to sort of, you know, hopefully speak your language a bit and sort of tell you how it actually works for you. Hopefully I've, I've managed to do that. Um, and then I guess I'll hand back over to Carl and we'll, we'll do questions, I suppose, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Right, yep. So I'll... Yeah, I've stopped sharing, mate. So you're excellent. Good. Thank you. Good to have it back. Uh, let's share the screen. So that's you can see that. Yes. Oh, good, Kyle. Yep. Thank you. Um, so yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Ryan. For that uh, was good insight um into ap2000 um and just a few of the features and that sort of thing um it, it, sort of uh, time's getting away from us a bit there so yeah, i think sorry. i think we'll um that's okay we'll uh we'll look to uh, explore a bit more into the uh into the range um of the 
uh, accurate stuff. I know there's a continuous uh, continuous monitoring in the 5,000, 7,000 with a lot more parameters and all that sort of thing is very um, is very good also. So I guess I'll quickly uh, touch on a couple of examples uh, a little uh, closer to home here just to give you an indication of some of the ways which is uh, which accurate has been uh, utilised so far for us um, in Oz. Um, firstly, uh, yeah, Minja Gold, uh, the Pajingo uh, Mine up in Queensland, uh, yeah, near Charters Towers. Um, you know, three three AP two thousand uh, handheld units, uh, which have been utilised for uh, over uh, you know ten years, which is. Um, only recently, two of them have needed uh, a couple of new meters, so um, really robust sort of um, meter there, especially up on the on the harsher sort of sites like a you know a, a gold mine uh, up there. So, sort of testifies, I suppose, to the to the robustness of them. Um, you know, twenty to thirty five uh, groundwater bores uh, per month with these units, um, as well as the surface water and wastewater discharge area. So really high utilization of the equipment here. Um, and the, uh, you know, the statements from the, from the, uh, from Walmiria and, um, Gemma up in, uh, Minja Gold were, you know, there's ease of navigation and, and, and calibration with these. So, uh, much to what Ryan was talking about, it's very easy to, uh, to hold the calibration and extremely easy to navigate, um, the meter as well, which was testimony, uh, from these guys. Um, also extremely easy to clean, uh, the probe with its components, um, as it can be, you know, easily unscrewed and, uh, screwed up. Uh, thoroughly again with those interchangeable sensors that you can uh, it's very much customizable and very much to your own so um, and finally there um, the Maloon Institute which is also a really uh, exciting um, prospect for us and a really exciting uh, prospect to be able to sh uh, showcase I guess the uh, the full uh, aqua read uh, capabilities and the range um, so just recently the Maloon uh, Institute in New South Wales, uh, we'll be looking at an extensive sort of floodplain monitoring uh, strategy, uh, which will utilise uh, Acquarid probes um, in the AP 7000s, which is uh, essentially uh, AP 2000 on, on steroids with the um, with the big uh, wiper as well uh, for the more sort of long term continuous data and a lot more parameters um, as well. Um, up to up to telemetry uh, through the use uh, of the black box, which which Ryan spoke about, um, and will be hosted by uh, Hydra data hosting platform Data Stream. Um, two times AP two thousands, uh, and more than fifty locations, which will utilise uh, the uh, level line uh, conductivity, temperature, and depth gauge sensors. So, in sort of uh, Acre also does um, a titanium based. Uh, level line in in both level and uh, temperature and conductivity uh, as well. So it's a project uh, in which you know they'll be capturing the Maloon Institute's sort of key catchment uh, health indicators uh, in order to gather, uh, develop sort of guidelines for sustainable um, but profitable farming. So that's an exciting prospect, and uh, I'm sure I'm positive that a formal case study will be. Um, coming out of that and if uh, you ever you want any more details on any of those um, please feel free to contact us and our uh, information will be at the end of this uh, PowerPoint um, presentation so just finally um, what I'll say is that uh, the amount the equipment that we have in our rental fleet here at Hydroterra so um, if you're interested at all from the things that we've spoken about today that Ryan has spoken about uh, or myself that uh, might interest you in uh, perhaps looking at the uh, Acreed uh, equipment but um, might not be best poised anywhere, uh, we do have a, a, a large rental fleet that you can utilise um, which has the Acreed stuff here. So the AP Lite, um, which is just one sensor at a time, the AP 700, uh, more of a uh, economically friendly um, handheld device, the AP 2000, uh, which was talked about extensively by Ryan, the AP 5000 and the uh, AP 7000. So I guess when we go up to the APs and we go into the higher 2000, 5000, that's um, essentially some extra features, but also uh, more parameters capable um, for that. 
um, monitoring. And I guess the AP7000 is sort of the cornerstone, um, you'd say, Ryan, for the uh, long-term continuous monitoring with that um, that external wiper uh, as well. So uh, we'll endeavour to talk more about those uh, in, a, in another upcoming webinar. Um, we might uh, sort of target to a continuous uh, water quality monitoring webinar or something like that. Um, but uh, in light of that, I think uh, we'll just look to uh, take any questions that you guys uh, might have had. So thank you for thank you for your time there. Um, I noticed that uh, Giuseppe uh, had uh, one question, uh, Ryan, which is probably best poised to answer, which is uh, is the uh, readings calculated uh, for the ion selective electrodes, uh, are they calculated as a rate using an algorithm or is it a real value? Um, it's a real, yeah, it's a real value. So, mm. yeah, so there's no sort of, there's no algorithm in there. So obviously, you know, there is some maths in there. Um, I mean, uh, an IOC sensor is just um, an electronic, um, well, Bit more advanced than a multimeter, um, but you know, it's just it's taking an electrical um current basically, yeah, that's how it, how it works. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, no, it, it is a it is a real a real reading. Uh, the maths comes in obviously converting that reading then to you know two milligrams a liter or to ppm. Um, but no, it is it is a, a genuine reading, there's no sort of algorithm or rate, um, as such. So mm -hmm. hopefully, that's the hopefully that's the correct answer, and that's answered what uh, the customer was asking, but uh, I think it was. Excellent. Um, if there was any other questions at all, um, I'll just uh, leave it for a couple of seconds here in case anyone else wanted to ask something. Um, but uh, in the essence of, uh, of time, I suppose, we'll uh, leave it there um, and I will uh, I'll be sure to um, uh, answer any other questions that you guys uh, may have. Um, in terms of in terms of uh, costings and everything as well, um, be, be sure make make sure to just uh, contact me. My email uh, address is there, and I'll be sure to um, provide those uh, to you for anything that you uh, you may want to look at. So, um, thanks very much uh, for your time here today, uh, everybody, and especially thank you, big thanks to uh, to yourself, Ryan, for for coming and talking. No worries. Today. I know it's uh, I know it's very early uh, where you are um, this morning, no, so we well, appreciate it. it. Yeah, it's five. It's uh, five to seven now in the morning. So it's, yeah, uh, there you go. So yeah. So uh, yeah, thanks very much. Mate. No worries. Um, so thank you all, and uh, we'll leave it there.